My name is Jeff Wasserberger. I am uh, a senator and I represent uh, District 23, which literally runs um, all the way to Lost Springs, Wyoming. And so uh, my main street is Highway 59. And that's very important, making sure we uh, have safe travel on Highway 59. Right now, I serve on the Senate Agriculture Committee and then also the um, Minerals Committee. And I also chair two other committees, a committee called the uh, Wyoming Pro Wyoming's Tomorrow, which is a task force looking into uh, doing innovative things with education. And then I'm also the chairman of the Community College funding task force. So that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, I have a number of different bills this year. I have a bill on geothermal uh, uh, power plants, <clears throat> which would create a task force that looks into that. Uh, and then also see if Wyoming is, is a good place for those types of uh, energy. And then also I have uh, the Gillette College bill, uh, which we'll talk about. And then um, I have a probate bill that essentially uh, my nephew is an attorney in Cheyenne and so he does that every day and he had some requests from a uh, judge to fix it and so that's that bill. So I will hand it off to Senator McCown. Senator? I'm Senator Troy McEwen. I thought I was coming here to eat cinnamon rolls. Uh, newly elected, been Lived in Wyoming, been a resident of Wyoming my whole life, spent 27 years in the Army, retired, and then decided I wanted to sell soup for a living, so we bought Don's Supermarket. I thought that was going to be easy. Boy, was I wrong. Uh, been married for 28 years, three kids, two grandkids. It's uh, been exciting so far, and about the only bill I want to bring up right now is the... Uh, public health orders and oversight. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to the Speaker of the House. Um, Eric Barlow, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with uh, many folks that we've uh, done this eight years, some of us, um, or maybe it's nine year, ninth year maybe we've been doing this. So appreciate the opportunity to come before you again. I apologize, um, I, I do have a weekly call with, uh, with the leadership of the um, Senate and the Governor's office every Tuesday at seven o'clock. So. I'm going to respectfully just step into this back room, get the, get the beginning, the introductions of that, and then I'll come back out. So I'm, I'm, I will be here. I'll answer the tough questions at the end. So I appreciate you, the opportunity to be here, and, and I apologize that I'm going to step out for just a few minutes. So thank you. Hello, I'm John Baer. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to answer your questions and share with you what uh, we're doing down there. Uh, I'm the owner of Bears Dry Cleaners over on Lakeway and just a new freshman representative. I represent District 31 in the house and that is the eastern half of Gillette. And uh, I'm also on the Minerals Business and Economic uh, Development Committee and so that's a great place for me to be to represent Campbell County. And so I appreciate the speaker putting me on that particular committee. Uh, I have four bills that I, I am running right now that uh, I think are going to be of particular interest. One is, uh, the first one I'm working on is to get rid of the two time changes a year so we won't have to spring forward and fall back anymore. And uh, I'm also working on two different recall efforts to just hold your elected officials accountable here in the state. Uh, I'm also working on a nullification bill to push back against the, the president's executive orders which are going to really impact this county a great deal. And lastly, I am working on a bill that uh, is going to tighten up the uh, human trafficking uh, laws so that uh, as that becomes a, a bigger and bigger issue in our state, we're prepared for that. I'm also co-signed on several other bills that uh, are going to affect your lives in the near future, and hopefully we're heading the right direction in those, those efforts. Thank you. My name is Bill Fortner. I'm fourth generation Campbell County native. I was born here, raised here, went to school here. Uh, everything that happens in Campbell Sir. County is just as personal to me as I know it is to the people that just moved here last year for, for jobs and economics go. Uh, I'm down there, we're trying, well, all of us down there is trying to keep a balance in taxes and, and uh, our econo economy here in Campbell County. My district is District 52. I run clear over to Crook County. 
I run, I run up to the Montana line, I run over to, uh, uh, towards Johnson County, then I come back down and I outskirt the city of Gillette, and then I go down, down to uh, the Bishop Road, down to the coal mine, uh, which is, is a pretty good sized district. Uh, I got three bills I'm running this year. I, they actually haven't been in yet. They'll go in at one o'clock today. I'm waiting for co-signers. Uh, and I believe uh, personally that, that we cannot diversify our economy with, with tax, with new taxes. I think we gotta cut taxes. And the bills that I'm running is, is gonna deal with that. This be stripper well tax exemption. They keep, stripper wells require a lot of maintenance, a lot of work, and that'll, that'll keep jobs in Campbell County. It will even open some of the wells that they, they've capped or, or shut down in the last year. Uh, so I, I look for that to, the, them tax dollars to make a bigger circle and create more money than just going into the government coffers. School tax credit, that's a, that's a big one. We're trying to figure out how to get that money past the government so that they can't control everything that we do. We need, we need uh, diversification, we need school choice. A lot of our money is going into the school system that, that uh, we start to lose checks and balances on and, and this, the system just keeps going up instead of, instead of leveling off and coming down. So that, that's one. And then uh, personal property tax. Uh, exempt, well, personal property tax uh, depreciation is the third one. And uh, basically what that does, if you, buy, if you buy a chainsaw and you're in the lumber business and, and you pay taxes on that at the beginning, uh, brand new price taxes, you pay that till the day you die. There's no, there's no depreciation on that tax. So that's what this does. It de this tax sets in a depreciation value on, on personal property when you're in business. Uh, I'm on the agriculture committee. We've been working on bills to do with uh, uh, slaughter plants, uh, beef processing, that kind of stuff. We passed House Bill 51 in the last eight days. They didn't quite have all their, all their uh, ducks in a row for uh, House Bill 54. Uh, they, they expected us to sign off on it, the Nancy Pelosi deal, that we, they'd go ahead and pass the bill, then later on they'd, they'd rewrite the bill for us, and we didn't, we didn't go for that. So anyways, that's where we stand. Uh, I enjoy working with the guys I have down there. On the Senate side, um, my House comrades, uh, John Bear, uh, Chris Knapp, and Speaker Barlow. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us today. Um, I know Eggs and Issues is a long tradition of early morning meeting with the legislators, but might I recommend lunch with legislators? <laughs> or dialogue at dinner? <laughs> I'm Chris Knapp, and um, one of the differences with me in this uh, group is I represent District 53 and I was actually appointed, not elected. So I was appointed for uh, the late Roy Edwards and I served with Roy on the commission. I served three terms on the county commission. And uh, one of the things that impressed me about Roy was he always stuck to his principles. And you've heard of yes men, Roy was a no man. <laughs> but it was based on his beliefs and his principles and he did not vary from that. So I just told him, it's easy because I know where you're coming from and I know why, and I just have to convince two other people to move forward on something. But Roy's principles is important to me because number one, I represent his district now. Um, I, went, I decided to put my name in because I'd like to reinforce the freedoms that we enjoy um, based on the U.S. Constitution and based on the Wyoming Constitution. And so I felt like with what was happen happening nationally, that it was very important that the state look at those freedoms, whether it's, whether it's guns, um, our rights as individuals, um, that it's very important that we reinforce those rights at a state level. Um, and then to protect our industry. I think it's time for Wyoming to redefine itself um, rather than commodities, we redefine ourselves as a blended power, blended source of power, and I hope to revenue our way to a bright future for Wyoming, so. Uh, first question is gonna be for Senator Wasserberger. Can you help us understand Senate File 83 and what benefits you see in Gillette College being its own district? So we have over the years discussed the future of our college. Um, right now I have a bill, Senate File 83, that um, 
has been moving through the process. And the process simply is this. First of all, uh, Campbell County Commissioners had to ask the <coughs> Wyoming Community College Commission for an application for a uh, new college. And so once that was done, then the WCCC did a study on our community and found that essentially overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly in favor of Gillette College being an independent community college. And so then it went to the uh, meeting of the Wyoming Community College Commission. And at the end of that four hour meeting, we had a vote of seven to zero. It was unanimous. Uh, there was not a single nay vote. And so at that point in time, the bill or the request, the application, is now before the Senate Education Committee, and it will be heard tomorrow uh, by Zoom, and the meeting will start at 8.30 in the morning. We have two bills in front of it. The first bill is the recalibration bill, which that will take some time to go through. Uh, there's 39 different funding uh, formulas within the model, and so they'll be looking at all of those. Um, that's actually a mirror bill. Uh, there's a bill that looks exactly like it in the House, and it is before the House also. So our bill is third. I would say that somewhere around um, 1030, we might be up. And I would think that uh, we should have a vote uh, by the end of the day, but maybe even before noon. And so we believe we are uh, talking well to the senators on that committee and that we have support for that bill. Um, but as, as always, as you know, the legislative process, you never really know what's gonna happen next. So that's kind of where the bill is. If you would like to be a part of that, uh, you can get on Zoom and sign up and then testify for or against. Thank you. Our next question is for Senator McEwen. Would you please explain Senate File 80, Public Health Orders, Local and Legislative Oversight, how will this help improve the lives of the citizens of Wyoming? I think we all know what happened during COVID. Everybody was told to put a muzzle on their face or two. I think Fauci's saying three now to be 90% effective. And, and our governor fell right in with it. And we're still legislating from the executive branch on what we're going to do with executive orders. Not to give everybody quick civics lessons, but Congress and the legislatures write law. They enforce law. Governors don't. And we keep writing executive orders to do things. So this bill basically gives him a 30-day window, because I think he needs that for states of emergency. But at the end of 30 days, I think the legislature needs to meet and decide if we continue on with it or not. It's really the legislature's job to uh, pass mandates, make laws, not the governor. So this bill basically gives him 30 days, and then it puts the onus back on us to get together and decide if we're going to continue or not and why. I think that's critical because we're your voice, and if you want masks, we'll give you masks. If you don't want masks, we'll get rid of masks. But at the end of the day, we need to speak for you on this issue and not turn it over to uh, whims of what they think today and tomorrow. So overall, the bill's designed to take the power away after 30 days from the health officer and the governor. And I think that's critical. And I think you get heard better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Uh, this question did not come to anyone in particular, so if somebody wants to jump in and answer this one, that would be appreciated. It is in regards to House Bill 88, the data center exemptions. Um, basically, explanation of what it is, uh, do we support it, are you opposed to it, um, and how does that impact some of our things like economic diversification, um, do we lose competitiveness if we don't have that in place? Uh, this is the data center down in Laramie County, and uh, some tax exemptions were provided to get Microsoft and other big tech companies to come in. They're there now, and uh, I believe that uh, the infrastructure is there, and I think that the time to tax everybody equally and, and discontinue picking winners and losers has come. So I'm in support of that particular bill. 
Next question is for Representative Knapp. Could you please talk about House Bill 75, voter fraud prevention? Why is this bill important to you? We have freedoms in this country, and one of the, the biggest freedoms is the right to vote, the right to choose who represents us, both locally and at a national level. And the integrity of that vote is very important. Um, so this just reinforces Wyoming's ability to have free and fair elections. And as we've seen nationally, um, that began to be in, in question. And so I think that we reinforce our freedoms, we reinforce our, our rights, and one of the biggest ones is, is that right to vote. With our current financial situation in the state, please explain your stance on solutions such as increasing taxes, reducing expenses, and or reducing services. Essentially what we have is a situation where um, we are going to spin down our legislative stabilization reserve account. And if we spend that $1.3 billion down, then we also don't have revenue off of that fund. We get an incredible amount of investments return on that money. So essentially what it is, is a, is a double, double hit to you, actually. Um, so the question is, how far do we let LISRA uh, become a, low, a lesser amount all the time? And so the issue is sooner or later, we're going to have to not only raise revenue, but we uh, also have to have cuts. Right now, uh, six years ago on the Appropriations Committee, we cut $410 million. This legislative session, it looks like we're gonna cut $500 million. So in the last six years, we've cut about almost a billion dollars out of the budget. And we are back to a budget in 2004. So uh, the question is, you know, how many services will the state of Wyoming uh, do without? Uh, our citizens are already, already talking to me about issues that are going to happen to our senior citizens. Uh, they're talk about veterans exemptions, those kinds of things. And if, if we're going to keep those things, then somehow or another, uh, we have to decide when the cuts are as deep as we can go and how are we going to, to take the rest of our state forward with different revenue streams. And so that's gonna be the most important issue, I think, in the next two years. And I'll turn it over to the rest of you. I ran on a platform of not raising taxes, and so I am not for raising any taxes. But the idea has been tried and proved before that as we reduce the size of government and the onus on the private sector, the private sector grows. Therefore, revenues actually do increase to the, the state. So if we keep our tax burden low, we'll probably be able to maintain more services than if we raise taxes. So it's a pretty easy solution for me. The state is required to do audits. We have been required to do audits since 1983. I really want to emphasize on the state, not the county. Uh, we're not doing those audits. We have buckets of money hidden all over the place. They call them reserve accounts and about I think the quote I heard this weekend on the budget thing was five people in the state really understand the budget and where all the money is. I think that's a problem. We need to find where the money is. We need to define the buckets before we even start talking about taxes. We, we really need to know what's going on before we start reaching out to take more money out of people's pockets. So at this point in time, I'm pushing to do audits, I'm pushing to identify where we're at before I'll even entertain a new tax. Thank you. If you go to about anybody down there that knows anything about the budget in Cheyenne, they'll tell you the two biggest costs to, to the state is uh, state employees and then the school system right behind that. We're gonna have to cut both of those extremely uh, to continue on the downfall that we're having. We're gonna to have to get ahead of that downfall, so we're gonna to have to go ahead and get them cuts made. And, and they're not just gonna be little cuts, they're gonna be, be big cuts, and we're gonna to have to implement new kinds of uh, school programs, like school choice, uh, open that up to it so where we don't have a monopoly in the school system, uh, and actually invite more, more schools aboard. Competition has always prevailed over monopolies. Thank you. I think it's gonna to be tough, I think that 
every single one of us as, as citizens, as governments, need to define what government is, what government services we want, and what are we willing to pay for it. Um, and that's the same in education, um, defining education, what is that to our citizens? And what do the citizens uh, want to pay for that? I, I was commissioner when, when times were pretty good economically. But you have to have the same core principles of what government is when times are good or when times are bad, because both happen. And when you grow government, there's no way to take it back. So you're very careful with what services you provide and what people are willing to pay for it. We've been lucky because minerals has taken that, that burden on us. So as we go into the future and our structure changes, I believe that economics will still play a part in that, but we need to decide what is government and what are we willing to pay. The next question is for Representative Fortner. Could you please talk about House Bill 110 Business Council promoting Wyoming's low tax structure. What are you trying to accomplish with this legislation? I think it's extremely important that uh, we, we need diversification. Uh, and you don't get diversification by running around hollering high taxes, you know. And, and uh, hopefully, same time this bill passes, uh, we'll get numerous bills that, that cut taxes and, and deals with the free, uh, freer marketplace and, and turns some things back so, so people can spend more money out in society and create the taxes out there instead of just throwing them right at government. Government, uh, when they come take your dollars, I don't, they, they do not know how to spend your dollars as well as you know how to spend them. I, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, you know where your dollars uh, fit best in your life. Uh, you spend them to, to the best of your ability. You're, you, everybody in this room has to ha be accountable for a budget at their house. Uh, at this point in time, government hasn't been accountable, whether it's state government, federal government. Uh, my opinion, county and city government hasn't really been accountable for, for the times that we're facing. We're, we're on a downslide, uh, and, we, and the bottom we don't even see yet. But uh, minerals, like Chris said, is, is where it's at for Wyoming. The way things are turning, you know, and everybody thought uh, a year ago that we had till 2035, you know, to, to play this out, or 20, even 2050. Uh, and the truth is, it was all on the an end of a pin of uh, Biden right now. He, he, he's turned things back uh, real fast from what Donald Trump did in his term. And, and I mean, he's just getting started. So uh, we can kick the can down the road and, and do nothing, or we can promote Wyoming and get diversification. We're about 40 years behind everybody else because we just took, thought fossil fuels would be here forever. But now real, realization has set in and we need to face the fact, you know what? We need to promote Wyoming and we need to get more business in here and we need to do it fast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question came in, are you in favor of House Bill 77, the school district reorganizations? Why or why not? And I can remember where that was one of the biggest floor fights I've ever seen on the House floor back when I was in the House. And uh, essentially there was a bill to consolidate districts, this would have been 1997 or so, and the bill died by just a handful of votes. But it was so acrimonious that, uh, for the most part, we didn't ever dare bring it up again. <laughs> but um, that is an excellent way, actually, to cut uh, education expenses, because if you went to a system where there were 23 counties the county school district was countywide. Um, I, I don't see where that would injure any schools throughout our state, and, and we would save the administration dollars for those other districts. And Campbell County has been a unified district since the 1960s, so we've been there. And so uh, the issue is a little bit different in Converse County, where I represent two school districts. Um, but they're doing a lot of things cooperatively with each other in Converse County 1 and 2. And, and so it's an easy thing, I think, to say, yeah, maybe that's, that's one area where we could save some money. I will caution you in thinking that it's going to save you a lot of money because it's not. It's, it'll be, you know, it might be five, ten million, um, but a little bit at a time helps. So 
I think we're all being real careful, so I'm going to open the, the can of worms. As we look at the state budget, the largest part of it's K through 12 education. In the year 2000, we spent half a billion dollars on K through 12. Today, we spend 1.8 billion. We have almost 3,000 less students, and we have 3,600 more employees in the state. So you just got to scratch your head and wonder, why are we doing this? If you apply a 53% inflation rate, we should be spending 800 million, not 1.8 billion. It's the largest thing on the plate. We're running out of money, and eventually somebody has to say, K through 12 education needs to go on a little bit of a diet. Thank you. It's the really small districts that are doing a good job of managing their district because they have local control. The school board reports directly to the people of the town. Uh, the, the one that I'm most familiar with is uh, Weston number seven uh, over in Upton. They do a great job. They have found all kinds of efficiencies and when the governor asked for a 10% cut to funding, they stepped in and cut different areas and they'd already cut some before then. So there is a, a bad side to 77, and that is that some good districts are going to be swallowed up and they're going to lose local control. So I'm hoping that we can get some amendments to this bill so that well-run districts and well-organized uh, school boards can uh, continue to, to manage and report directly to the people of that community. So that's the concern about 77. We do need to become more efficient, and we need to find ways to do that, and I think consolidating is a good way to do that. We just do it, have to do it smartly. I don't have much to add to that. These guys said about everything that I, I had to say, so I'm, go ahead, Chris. Schools are a challenge because things have changed so much over time. Schools are no longer just a teacher and students. There's facilitators, there's a social aspect to school. The times have changed and so the costs have changed. And again, I think it's, it's a matter of local control and local districts deciding what they can do, how to redefine education. Um, Superintendent Balo has some, some excellent progressive ideas when it comes to the state of Wyoming and education. It's just how much of that can be implemented um, through, through both charter, through um, digital aspects, which we've all kind of dealt with um, this year. Um, but, but it's going to be a challenge for all education in the future, I think, to, to try to accomplish what has been put in front of it to accomplish with the money that's available. Representative Barlow's back, so here's your question. <laughs> Just one. Can you explain House Bill 102, Wyoming Preference Act of 1971, and how will that affect Wyoming contractors? Sure, thank you very much. So um, in my legislative career, I've never taken a bill that didn't come from our community, didn't come from a constituent in our community that had an issue or thought there was an issue, and we tried to understand it, research it, and figure out a way to maybe accommodate or alter things. So um, the Preference Act, the, the Wyoming Constitution requires that public works projects, um, Wyoming workers be... Um, preferenced for that. They, they be the first option to work on Wyoming. So those are pub tax dollars working on public projects and that Wyoming workers be the first in line for those jobs. There are times when that is very difficult. And Wyoming has right now maybe not as a tight a job market as it has in the past. But when the job market gets is very tight in, Cam in Wyoming and particularly in Campbell County, Northeast Wyoming because of the energy industry, it can be very difficult for um, contractors to find the skilled people they need. And so there is a process um, also um, within statute that allows them, uh, and this is, goes back to what government can and can be in the way sometimes and can get out of the way sometimes. There's a process in statute that allows the contractors to apply through the workforce services um, to have um, dispensations isn't the right word, but waivers basically to have out of out of state workers work on their on their jobs on those public works jobs. Um, but it's job by job. And the easiest way is if you drive from here to the South Dakota line or here to Sheridan, every bridge might be a different job. 
So they might have to get a different waiver for every bridge, whether it's SNS or DRM or whoever happens to be the local contractors that we deal with this. So what we tried to do, what this bill tries to do is basically open it up so that you can, you certify the, the laborer, the person that you need, not every individual job. So that's the intent, and I, and I hope that, you know, the advocates that, who are in this, some of them in this room that thought this might be helpful, um, if they want, you want to speak to them, I can point them out later. <laughs> Thank you. We had a question come in for Senator McEwen. Unfortunately, it doesn't address a specific bill, so hopefully you um, will be up to speed enough to know which one this is, but it is asking, do you believe that the legislation has the right to decide medical decisions that involve patient care and safety? Is the medical decisions decisions really in your scope of service, and who funds these medical decisions that have outcomes? Can I just say no? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think the legislature needs to be in between you and a doctor. I I really wish I knew which bill they were referencing, because there's, I mean, we can go to the Baby Born Alive Act. I think that's where this is headed. I might be wrong. I hope whoever asks a question, I'm answering the right one. I think uh, once a baby's born, no matter through what method, that baby requires the same care we would give anybody in this room. It's, it's not right to end the life at that moment because it's financially convenient, socially convenient. So I, I'm pretty sure I think that's what the question was. And and answers no. We shouldn't be involved in it. That's between you and your doctor. But on the other hand, we have a moral my moral compass leads me to believe we gotta do whatever we can to keep anybody alive at any given time. Thank you. Could you please discuss House Bill thirty seven on road usage charge? With the large amount of private sector trucking and hotshot service in Campbell County what benefit would we see for having to pay tolls on every highway? So there's very few privileges besides ordering paper clips and making sure there's enough copies of bills and uh, things like that for a speaker, for a presiding officer, speaker of the house. One of them is I do have the ability to put things in a bottom drawer. House Bill 37 will never see daylight in this upcoming session. So I don't know if that's the answer you wanted, but that's what you get. The speaker has the opportunity to kill any bill that he doesn't like, and so does the president of the Senate, and so do the uh, majority floor leaders in the House and Senate, and then also a committee chair can kill a bill by just not bringing it up. But what I would like to say is uh, House Bill 37, I've received a lot of commentary on that bill, and the only thing I'm going to say is the Transportation Committee was trying to figure out a way to tax electric cars. That was the reason for the bill. Now you really think about that, electric cars, we go to the gas pump, we buy gas, we pay tax to drive on the road, but an electric car does not. And they're also heavier than a regular car, so they cause more damage to the road. And so that's what the Transportation Committee was trying to do. And I'm not sure they got it right, but at least they attempted in the interim. So that was the reason for the bill. There are other options regarding transportation funding before the legislature. There, there's a fuel tax bill. There is a uh, I-80 uh, toll bill, steady bill, and I think a, a straight up bill. So there are, and, and transportation, our, our road infrastructure is very important to this state. Very important to whether you're, you're a soccer mom or whether you're, Going to uh, going down, um, you know, 59 to the coal mine, or whether you're going across I-80 delivering goods um, across this United States and interstate commerce. So there's no question that transportation is Im important, and that having a good uh, road system is um, is you know paramount to our to our communities and to our businesses. Um, but look, we're gonna we're gonna take the we're gonna do the things that are probably more understandable and and more easily implemented before we do things that are uh, way out there. And in my view, 37, there's other things we can do before we get to 37. And we will, potentially. Consider them, I don't know what we'll do, but we'll <laughs> consider them. That one won't get considered this year. 
And if that bothers you, come see me afterwards because you're going to be in a small crowd. <laughs> uh, we had a question for Representative Bear. Uh, what is the impetus of House Bill 74, removal of elected officials? And what is the hope with accomplishing in this bill? Um, specifically, they would like to know where you came up with the thresholds for the amount of people that would need to sign the petition for the removal of an elected official. Thank you for the question. And the answer is accountability. Uh, I believe that every elected official should be held accountable. And that's why HB uh, 74 has a mirror uh, effort, and that's a, a House resolution to make all elected officials recallable in the state. But a resolution like this, it's to change the Constitution, because we are one of about seven states that don't have the ability to recall our elected officials. So I think it's time that that was changed and everybody was held accountable. HB 74 does not address everybody. The good legislature in 2014 passed a law to allow for recalls for elected officials from the city uh, on down. So your mayor, your councilman, and other elected positions at that level. Uh, unfortunately, it was put in the wrong part of law. It was put in a part that applies to commission style towns and cities, and we don't have any of those in Wyoming. So the law has been already taken to court and found to be and effective. So HB 74 simply pulls that law out of that part of, of the statutes and puts it in a place where it can be effective. The question also was asked, how did I come up with the thresholds? Well, hopefully by being a good legislature and speaking to the people out there, what I found was in small towns, it's not a good idea to have a, a low threshold for a, a recall because if a, a mayor ticks off his neighbor pretty soon, he's got nine more neighbors and they're recalling the guy. So what we did is for small towns, we lifted the threshold. You have to have more signatures to get those positions recalled. The statute as it sits right now is 25% of the electorate has to sign uh, a petition to get a recall going. And so what we did is we started with 25 for the really big cities with 4,000 electors or, or more. And then we went uh, to 30% and then to 35% for the really, really small towns. Again, the other effort is for statewide, every elected official, that's gonna be a bigger threshold to change the Constitution. It's gonna take a couple of years to do that, and it has to pass both the House and the Senate by two-thirds before it goes to the people for a vote. And just a little civics lesson, once uh, something like that gets on the ballot and the people approve an amendment to the Constitution of the state of Wyoming, uh, then it comes back to the legislature to make statutes and, and the rules that will apply to each of those elected officials. So again, it's just about accountability and I wanna be held accountable. Uh, I want you all to be able to hold your elected officials accountable. Thank you. House Bill 99 stipulates property tax on real and personal property, property shall be limited to a 3% increase in a single year. Has this been an issue? I'd like to address that. I'm a, a signer on that bill as a, as a sponsor. And uh, really what this comes down to is uh, helping all of us as property owners, but especially those who are retired uh, and are on fixed incomes and they own a property. We've seen in uh, across the state, but especially in, uh, in Casper, where we've seen 100, 200, and 300 percent increases in a single year. And we're going to see it here because as people move into the state and buy uh, ranch properties for purposes other than ranching, we're going to see property values increase very quickly. And uh, when those, sometimes it's based on corrections. If an assessor has missed something in the past, they just want to get it corrected. The problem is, is that as taxpayers, that can really hurt somebody if they haven't uh, you know, prepared for that. So this limits it to a 3% per year increase. I think it's reasonable, and I think it's gonna really help our elderly people on fixed incomes that own properties. On uh, public health emergencies, um, we talked about the accountability back to public health um, and some of those mandates. Um, some of the questions was, does having the legislation uh, weigh in on these orders make sense given the time sensitive subject of matters during a global pandemic? Um, even the follow up there for uh, Senator McEwen, um, they were specifically talking about that public health Senate file 80. Um, so there's been quite a bit of 
questions coming in on that. So if maybe a few other folks would like to just share more, a little more insight, it feels like there's a lot of questions regarding what that does that look like, how does it happen, and what is the hope and purpose of it? Um, I'm going to I'm going to make a comment about the the what I perceive perceive as a presiding officer for the health bills as they come to the House. Right now, I think there are four uh, bills related to health orders before the House. Um, they all all have a little different approach. Um, and my my intention is, and I visited with our leadership team and with the um, with um, the chairman, the various chairmen at various committees. I'm going to send them all together to one committee. Um, let that committee um, sort out how they want to approach, which one they think is the the right um, format, and then if they bring something to the floor, it'll come to the floor and that thing. So process-wise, they're not going to get ignored. They're not going to get, but we're going to. We're going to package them up, send them to the, uh, a committee that we, I believe, can handle the work, and um, they come out. That's probably in the second or third week. Um, as you know, this we've already done nine or ten days, technically, of uh, or nine days of legislation, uh, legislature already. We can not go beyond 40, so that leaves us 31 days. We always like to have a couple days in the bank for the budget session. Um, so these health orders are probably in the House side, and there's I know the Senate. Senate has their own or their own versions and their own things. On the House side, they'll probably go out um, and be considered in the end of the second week and third week of the session. That still gives them, like I said, 15 days in the process um, should they advance from the House side. So, process-wise, that's what I would um, suggest you'll you'll be seeing. Thank you. I'd like to address a couple things. Earlier, there was a question about uh, whether the legislature should be getting in the way or uh, having an opinion about health and uh, medical decisions. And I've heard this question before based on some legislature that I have, and that is a, I have a House resolution uh, basically reprimanding the Wyoming Board of Medicine, and I'd like to explain that. Uh, because my solution is not one of getting in between the doctor and the patient, but rather making sure that the government doesn't do that just that. So the Wyoming Board of Medicine came out early on in the pandemic and said that doctors in Wyoming had to uh, follow the American Medical Association's prescribed treatments or they may be investigated. And it was kind of heavy-handed way of saying, uh, you know, just don't be trying things outside of the normal method of care, but we had a, a disease or a, a problem, a, uh, an issue that really nobody knew how to solve, and so uh, it would be better that doctors and patients make those decisions. Our Constitution actually allows for that, and so I asked the board to go back to the Constitution and honor that relationship between the doctor and the patient. And again, back to the, the bills themselves, each of these bills that I've looked at uh, and and uh, co-sponsored has a time where the governor and the uh, his advisors including the uh, um, health officer can make decisions it's just allows a time limit where the public can get involved because they're impacting our economy our our way of life and uh, we need to have a say in this that's it I'd like to mention that I co-signed on every one of these bills and the reason I did is because with this last uh, COVID epidemic, uh, there was no consistency or, or conformity uh, on anything that anybody did. We, we had everybody with, with masks on uh, in public places. Well, there's people so scared they're wearing them in their own vehicles, and they still are. But that's public, that's your choice. But the thing that I seen that, that, that I didn't, uh, that really stuck out and I didn't like, and, and I went to the county commissioners and I spoke out against it, but anyways, is, is mandating somebody to, to do something that they, their constitutional right hasn't been, uh, that, that issue hasn't went through, through our legislature in Cheyenne. Uh, we need to rule on that. That can't be done at a, at a uh, right now it can be done at a public health uh, servant that the governor chooses. Uh, that, the constitution wasn't set up that way. Everything's supposed to go through legislature. Uh, the other thing that I, that I didn't like about it is while you're wearing your mask and everybody's watching out for each other's health, uh, most of those masks, the micron count wasn't sufficient for the mask that you was wearing. So basically the mask was doing you no good, which basically puts you at more, more risk and more harm uh, than if you didn't have your mask on. 
And thirdly, we had sports going on in, in, the, in the high school, the school, high school, grade school, every level. Uh, wrestling in particular, where these people didn't have a mask on. Uh, they wrestled all, their whole bout. Uh, they, whenever they, the uh, uh, decision came around, whether you won or lost, you couldn't shake your opponent's hand because of COVID. Well, you just, you just watered all over him on the mat. There's no common sense. I mean, it's just that stupid. So, I mean, it's time for us to have a serious look while we're costing, like John said, costing our whole economy a whole bunch of tax dollars by everybody being afraid and going in half mode. Uh, we need to have cons some consistency there. And I believe this way we're going to get it. Thank you. I, I can't make this up, but my wife flew down to Texas to see my daughter yesterday. She got off the plane in Denver, and they said, okay, you wore a mask on this plane. The next plane, you have to wear two masks because you had the one on, so you need another mask. At the end of the day, at uh, the two grocery stores I own, we never enforced a mask mandate. In fact, we put a sign outside saying it's your choice. And now we've been doing this for almost a year. I have yet to have an employee get COVID. So uh, we got to get out of the business of trying to figure out how we're going to stop a flu virus. Thank you. 30 to 40% of small businesses will not have made it through this pandemic. A lot of banks will not finance a restaurant anymore. We represent you as a people, this is a republic. And our freedoms, that's one of the way that they're protected is you represent, we represent people because they voted to protect your freedoms. And some of those freedoms mean not giving one person the power to shut your business down or not giving one person the power without check to have your personal freedoms taken away. And so I think this is very important um, and the legislature has, has presented some things that just keep those things in check that every 15 days or every during a pandemic um, that there needs to be a re, re ratification, I guess, of rules that come from either a public health official, the governor, um, and those are just to protect your freedoms. Senate File 86, Attorney General elected official. Do you support this? Why or why not? Well, um, so, and, and this is, uh, I guess this is a, a way I approach things. I don't actually get very involved in things until they actually come to the House. You can't, there's too many bills out there, a couple hundred bills. And um, until I actually know what action is taken in the Senate, I mean, unless I'm a co-sponsor, and that's why some of these folks are, are getting questions on bills they're co-sponsors on. I'm not a co-sponsor on that bill, not because I wasn't offered, and I don't know that I would have considered if I'd have been offered, but I wasn't. So I don't spend a lot of time on the elected, on the, on the bill if it's a Senate file. I will say this, we have five statewide electeds now. Um, auditor, state superintendent of public instruction, um, treasurer, secretary of state, and governor. Um, adding a sixth one, you know, we're just, we gotta be careful. Are we growing government with that? Or are we protecting something with that? Are we gonna give up something? Is the auditor necessary anymore? Is, are there, is there one of those others? So I just, it's just a balance you have to find. Is there a place, for, you know, what, the, and those other five, they serve on the state land board, the SLIB board, the uh, state building commission. I mean, they have other roles. So what are we gonna get out of an elected attorney general that we may not get? out of um, a current one. There are states that have elected attorney generals. Um, you know, you can, art, you, can, you can have a discussion on both sides. So I don't know a position on the bill, we'll see what the Senate does with it first. Um, but yeah, I, I think I'd be, I'm hesitant about it because I think we need to look at how, what we already have as statewide electeds. Thank you. I, I think the intent of the bill is right now the governor has approximately 109 lawyers and the attorney general and, and it's almost a personal law firm, they, they follow what he wants more than they follow what you want. Uh, I think the speaker brought up a good point. Are we going to grow more government if we make an elected position? Or are we going to develop more lawyers to support the governor's office? Right now we have all these lawyers and we do a lot of contract business for lawyers outside of the government. Uh, I think at the end of the day, there's no recourse. If you're upset with the attorney general, you don't even get to vote or not vote. So 
I'm probably going to support the bill. I like it. I think you need to pick the attorney general and not who's sitting in the governor's mansion. Thank you. We do want to have an attorney general that uh, responds to the people. Therefore, I'm currently in support of the bill. Um, but as I look at this, this could really be contentious because typically what happens in other states that have an elected attorney general is that becomes the position that is going to next run for governor. And so you can have these two fighting each other. And as the good senator mentioned, they end up lawyering up and you have lawyers on both ends. And who's paying for that? The state's paying for that. So we have to be cautious about this. I think the, the good speaker mentioned a good uh, thought, and that is, should we reduce the other, some of the other elected officials if we add an attorney general to be elected? So we just have to be wise about it. And I'm not opposed to Wyoming being different. Um, thank you. I'm actually a co-sponsor on that bill. And the reason I did that was, I think, Somebody has it's got the the personnel the, that they're using in down in Cheyenne for for government services and Attorney General it, it covers a big area they 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 take in a lot of stuff uh, and they're only accountable to the governor so I think accountability plays more into this than anything uh, I do know one thing that uh, there's been conflicts of interest in Cheyenne and. Really with the system we got set up and the Attorney General working for the governor, we never really get to see those conflicts of interest. The way they determine a conflict of interest, whether you got one down there or not, is if you got everybody in the Senate and the House in the conflict of interest, then it's okay because you got all these people in there. But if you got one guy, then you got a problem, then he's a conflict of interest. And that's wrong. That's not the definition of a conflict of interest in my opinion. So I, I think that would help to sort of clean up uh, the porch down in Cheyenne. Uh, so I'm for it. Thank you. I think one thing you have to look at with legislation is unintended consequences. And um, we're, we're fortunate in Wyoming, and I, not to get political, but um, the AG works for the governor, um, both Republicans, and everything works fine. But with population shifts in the future, um, that might not always be the case, and I think there are instances in, in many other states where an AG becomes a handcuff to a governor, um, and it is for political reasons, because they are, they are grooming themselves to be next in line to run for that office. So I think if, if something's working um, right now a, as an unintended consequence preventer um, for the future, uh, things just can remain the same. It, it's been exciting. I really enjoy what I'm doing. We have a lot of tough decisions and a lot of hard times ahead of us as a state. We got to balance cuts versus revenue flows. And I really think that's where we're at right now. And a lot of people would say it's a bad time to be there. I actually think it's an exciting time. We're actually going to have an ability to maybe have some effect and maybe come out of this in better shape uh, and redefine what we do as far as spending, what we re redefine what we do is gathering revenue. We've got to look at other ways other than inventing new taxes, such as a road usage charge. In, in my mind, that's the easy way out. We've got to redefine how we're auditing things and, and we, as legislatures, need to understand where we're at monetarily, and I think we need to keep heading to where we're heading to one checkbook, one savings account, and we need to make it transparent. You need to know where we're spending your money. And if we want more of your money, you need to know why. And it doesn't need to be in hidden buckets. And at the end of the day, if I can have some effect on that, I think I'll have done what I went down there to do. Thank you. So first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, thank you for the chamber, as always, um, and, the, and your business advocacy group as well that I've uh, learned a lot from in the last couple of years. Um, this will be my last general session in the House of Representatives. And uh, so at the end of my five terms, if I make it to the end of the five terms, um, 
you know, uh, you, try, you try to make small differences. And occasionally you get to make something, maybe it's a bigger difference. Um, but a lot of times it's just small things. Small things for a community, for a particular industry, um, things like that. And, and, and I know, um, I came in with big plans too. I wanted to go to a cash-based budget. I tried six different times to get us on a cash-based budget. It's, it's challenging. It's challenging when we have cyclic revenues like we do. You gotta have money in the bank to do that. So there's big things that can be done, but a whole lot of what we do is just, you know, pick up pieces, fix things that didn't quite work the last time. Um, and that's, and that's, you know, that's, that's the majority of the work we do. At least that's the way I look at it. Are there, t are there times you can do something that's a legacy? Absolutely, there are legacy things out there. But they're not, they don't, there aren't 25 of them every session. Maybe there's one, maybe there's two. Maybe you'll learn a little bit. Um, and you improve something or fix something. So as a presiding officer, and, I, and this, it's a privilege, and they can, take, they can vote to take it away from me. Um, it only takes a majority vote of the House to take that away. Um, my, I'm gonna focus on the process and making sure that all of our members on the House side <coughs> Um, have an opportunity to bring forth their ideas, and they get vetted well, and then we send them to the Senate, and they do what they wish. Senate sends us things, we'll do our best too. Yeah, sometimes I'll make a gut call and say, road use charge, you're not gonna be seen this year. Um, but that's my job now. That's my job now, is to try to help the process to, um, to have, so an institution that some of you may serve into, in someday, or your children may serve in, hopefully still has a dignity, still has a place that will make a difference for the state of Wyoming and for its citizens. Um, so that's, when I look forward to what, what we can do, you do, you help guide me, direct me um, in that. That's what I think, that's my personal role right now, is to just protect the institution, protect Wyoming and the process that we have to hopefully build a better place for those of us who are here now and for those that come next. So thank you, keep reaching out, keep sending me those emails. Net metering seems to be a big one I'm getting a lot of emails on too. I, I can name off a half a dozen um, things that I'm hearing a lot about, but uh, if there's things on your mind, don't hesitate to holler and I'll be glad to try to assist. Thank you. I really appreciate being able to be here and just share with you all. Um, I have really enjoyed the cordial and respectful debate in the house. It's been uh, just a pleasure and I'm looking forward to many years to come doing more and more of that. I just really enjoy that. But uh, I wanted to take a moment, one of the bills that's on this agenda here that wasn't covered is Dr. Hallinan's HB 89. I just wanna quickly mention that what HB 89 is, is an alternative to what the school recalibration came up with. School recalibration came up with a 6.5% cut to education. Uh, the doctor came up with a 3.5% cut, just kind of making it a shallower cut into what we we'll see as big cuts in the future if we don't do something now. And so I, I just felt like that bill is a, a little bit better approach for our education system. And so I'm in support of that bill. And that's what that's about. Um, just really appreciate being able to represent the people of Gillette. And one of the things that I'm doing in an effort to create transparency is each night, as long as I have the energy to do so, I am doing a, a short video of what happened that day in the legislature so that you don't have to spend eight hours following us throughout the day if you don't uh, choose to do that. But I try to hit the highlights of what's happened and what's going on down there just to create some transparency for you. And I do that on Facebook, so uh, if you want to follow that, it's. Uh, John Bear for Gillette, but the other thing I do is for community leaders, our elected and our, our industry leaders, I also send a letter, uh, an email out each week with a recap, and so if you're not getting that, uh, please see me and I'd like to add you to that list so you can kind of get a recap for each week. Thank you. My reason for being down there is, is to try to keep checks and balances on our taxes, uh, control of government, I'm a big advocate to, uh, to downsize government, not grow government. I want to downsize taxes, not grow taxes. Like I say, I believe that's the freedoms of the, of the working man. And that's down there, that's who I'm representing down there is every working man in the room. Uh, some, at some point, I won't be representing somebody because I'll be representing somebody else. You know, but everybody here in, in District 52 is in my, in, in my district, I'm your representative, you know. Uh, like net metering, for example, uh, I've been hot on that since we come back from session. Uh, I'm for net metering. 
I'm for the bill that's our, or against the bill out here. We're, we're making amendments to it. I've been over and talked to Pacific Corp or Powder River Energy uh, numerous times on the phone and, and been there in person once, uh, me and Senator McEwen. Uh, we really don't have a problem with net metering in, in District 52 as far as Powder River uh, energy uh, customers are concerned. They got, they got 20, or 28,000 meters in, in the, in the five counties. Uh, they only got 62 net meters in that district, in our, in our district. Uh, I don't see it a problem. I don't see where they're going with it's a problem. They're selling power back at almost eight or 900% profit to these guys. Uh, but anyways, uh, and I know I've had, I've had some, uh, some emails from, from Black Hills. I worked with Black Hills on some road issues over on Garner Lake over there. Uh, but I, that's, where, that's what I mean by doing what I just said. Some, some instances I'll be working for you guys. Some instances I, I, you know, I won't be in your guys' boat, you know, and I hope you understand that. Uh, it's nothing personal. Uh, uh, I do anything I can to help you, but the, the small guy that's doing the net metering right now, uh, He's the guy that hauled it for my help first, and I've already dove in that boat. Uh, but along with that, uh, I, I got another subject that, that we re they really didn't touch much on, and it's the community college district. I'm not for that. I think that's going to kill industry in Campbell County as soon as they pass the bill that, that brings it out that everybody can vote on it for the simple reason that's a whole lot of new taxes in a down period. And, and that affects everything. I'm not, I'm not for that new college district. We, can't, we couldn't really afford it when, when we're riding on uh, Sheridan, shirt tail on, they, on their district that they have there for 53 years. Uh, I believe, and we subsidize that 3.5 million every year. And I believe when, when that comes aboard, we're gonna, they're gonna tell you that we, we, can, we can pull it off, we can handle it. But I believe that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a, a industry killer in Campbell County. I worked in coal for 20 years. I worked out in oil and gas for 20 years all across the state. Uh, I believe it's the wrong time. Could it have been good for, for Camel County? Maybe 20 years ago, but not now. I'm against that. Thank you. Well, I wanna thank everybody for having us. It took me to the closing remarks to, to be awake. So I don't know what answers <laughs> I gave before, but listen to this one. <laughs> um, one of the silver linings, I think, um, this year because of because of the pandemic and and having to make accommodations is the amount of participation. And and I I really want to thank you for having us, but but mostly thank you for being here because I have a committee meeting later today, and there will be more participation in that committee meeting um, off of Zoom with people testifying, with people listening, and I think that's happened this year at least in legislature, even though. I like the personal aspect and, and all of our representatives have been down in Cheyenne um, during any general session meeting, but it has allowed more Wyoming residents to, to log in and to have a voice. Um, you, can, you can sign up on YouTube to, to, have a, to speak at any committee meeting. Um, so it just has allowed more participation, I think, with our citizens, and that hopefully is something that will continue on into the future. So thank you for staying involved, being involved, and I encourage you to, to log in and, and watch some of that and participate in that as well. Our sessions will also be live as well. So you can actually, in the past, you'd be able to stream just the audio. This year, and I'm going down for two, three, three days, the last three days of this week just to test our system, you'll be able to actually see Senator McEwen, myself, whoever, testifying on the floor, not testifying, debating on the floor, and see, hear the discussion, whether about all of the different bills that may come before the floor. So both committee meetings, which have never been, um, had this access before, have this access now, and now the floor will have actually video and audio on it. So I think, um, to, to the good representative's point, I think all of a sudden, folks that wanted to understand or hear more and see more and be able to interact more. This is, this is as good as, well, I'm not, maybe it's not as good as it gets. We're not in a coliseum where everybody can just sit and watch it, but it's pretty dang good because you can be anywhere in the world and hear what's going on in the Wyoming legislature. And that I think is a big deal, a really big deal. And I'll tell you this, it's not like C-SPAN. It's not like C-SPAN where there's one person in the room and they're giving a speech to an empty room. 
We don't do that. If there's not a quorum in the room, we're not streaming. The gavel will not come down until we have a quorum in the room, and, and you'll get to be participate in that, at least from the audience perspective. So thank you, Gail. I'd like to tag on to that. We had a uh, part of one session. We actually had, I think it was 900 people. We had 900 people around the state watching. It's fantastic. Thank you. So let's give the legislators a round of applause for being here today. Again, if you, if you do want to contact any of them, all their contact information is on the legislative website, so you can find that. Or if you can't find it, call us. We have that information as well.